personal hygiene, even though the river is well known to be massively polluted and dangerous for human consumption. Nevertheless, every single day they are using it to drink, to bathe, to wash, to brush their teeth all of the time. Festivals are held on the, the guts on um, floating stages. And here is one from the night after the, the Festival of Lights. It's being dismantled. And um, they come and go, and it's an endless uh, march of festivals and, and celebrations happening along the guts. This is a particularly well-known gut, and with its painted columns, can see it from quite a distance, and it leads into a, a major market area where it is chaotic beyond belief. I, there is nothing I can compare it to for you. And it, it's also, it, it leads to the area where one of the main temples are, um, which is something that I'd like to share with you another time because it truly deserves more attention. It was such a powerful spiritual experience. And um, it was recently threatened with a bomb. And, and so I think I must have been through like eight searches before I was allowed in. And which really is... Um, an unusual experience in Varanasi because typically there's no real tension between Muslims and, and Hindus, so this was a new experience for them to have to have that level of security at the temple. This is one of the cremation ghats. Uh, um, there are two at least that I know of where fires have been burning literally for hundreds in one place, they say thousands of years, constantly available for cremation. There's an estimation of a hundred bodies a day being cremated at these cremation grounds. Not only in these cremation grounds, grounds but um, you know, at night time, we could see on the opposing bank the fires coming up where people from all over the country are bringing their dead to Gangaji to have them cremated as they have been doing for centuries. And in these times, they travel great distances sometimes with the body of the deceased strapped to the top of their car to bring them there for this most auspicious ending. This is another shot of... Um, these massive laundry days, you know, taking place. I, I was so fascinated to be walking through saris and bed sheets and clothing all being laid out to, to dry while people in the river are smashing their clothing against giant rock slabs placed out into the water as a way of shaking the dirt and debris out. Fascinating. And here is a picture of a modern crematorium. You can see the smoke going up. and It's right next to the traditional cremation ground and it's for those people who maybe prefer not to have the traditional shoreline burning but nevertheless they they want to be cremated in Varanasi because it's very auspicious to be cremated there in fact if you die in Varanasi all the better because you end the cycle of rebirth right there and then and they jokingly say if you can just get through the gates before you die, and in fact, many people do that. They make their way to Varanasi at the end of their days to spend their remaining days penniless and um, possession-free, waiting for the glorious end in this place, which is considered to be the meeting ground between heaven and earth, holy and secular. So they live in um, temples and on the street and with a ready happiness for the next moment. Some of the buildings on the guts have got dates on them like 1802, but there are others that are so ancient they are beyond conception of how old they must be. Many of them in disrepair and ruin and abandoned and sometimes people just build a new layer of building as you can see on top of the abandoned buildings and the city just goes up. You can literally see people just moving on up in the world and some are palaces and some are old forts and some have been donated by royalty in India to the wandering sadhus and God-crazy naked worshippers so that they might have a place. You know, in India they know what to do with people who are God-crazy. You know, over here we arrest them. There they feed them and give them a home. You know, interesting. And um, they're so colorful and filled up with architecture that 
comes from so many different influences. And because it is scripturally mandated that every Hindu must make at least one trip in their lifetime, a pilgrimage to Gangaji, to bathe and purify, you can see loads of people arriving or in small family groups like this one, um, having traveled very far to get there. And as soon as they get there, the car door opens and the singing starts, joyous prayers and into the river they go. One of the boys at the ashram is actually a casualty of one of these trips because in a massive ceremony, a massive pilgrimage, he became separated from his family and was found on the banks by the police and brought to the orphanage where he's been there for two years where they still haven't found where he belongs and he's probably going to stay there and go through the whole school system. I mean, you, this is India, you know. And people um, bathe there for personal hygiene and also, as I mentioned, as a ceremony of blessing and cleansing. Now, if you're bathing there for hygiene, the clothes come off. If you're bathing for spiritual cleansing, the clothes stay on. And then you go to temple wet for the second part of the blessing. Very interesting. And um, I understand that the original directions, um, scripturally speaking, is that you are to visit every one of the guts. And there are many. I think it's like over a hundred, I don't know how many there are, but you, you go to every one of them, get into the Ganga G, and then you go to the temple wet, and then you go to the next guide, and if you really look at how many of them, you're probably talking about a day and a half of activity with pneumonia at the end. And as a result, out of compassion, there's now a reduced or truncated version available. Isn't that so wonderful? So there are specific guts like this one that are now part of the required ceremony, but there's a reduced number because there's this compassion for people who have to travel far, sometimes you know, with very little resources to get there and don't have 40 days or two days or whatever it is to complete the spiritual pilgrimage. For example, if you have to go to all of the major temples in Varanasi, it's two days and people don't always have that. So there are shortcuts now for spiritual pilgrimage. It's very much like our labyrinth. You know, if you can't go to the Holy Land, walk the labyrinth and have the experience. And so in the same way, if you don't have all those hours or days to give up in your life to do the spiritual pilgrimage, now there are temples that have miniatures of all of the major temples that you can walk around and touch each one just like a labyrinth and have the same experience to symbolic complete the journey in your own consciousness. And I think that's absolutely just wonderful. And from the river, looking at the ghats, it's, um, it's a beautiful scene. And, and the river is quiet and solid and powerful and moving and yet it feels so still and, and it's not until you hit the land that you start to experience this pace this noise this intensity the people the sounds the overwhelming and, and my preferred way of getting around through these busy moments were on these Cycle rickshaws, quite an adventure, you know, four or five people sometimes piled upon one. And, and, and they drive on the other side of the road there, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that <laughs> from just looking, because there's not really a, a rule of driving that I encountered. And the streets are um, narrow, there's little lanes, no wider than one of the aisles in our sanctuary, like this one up there. And remarkably, one like this could be filled up with cows, bulls.